I really believe that the next four or five years are extremely pivotal. I, I think I think a hundred years from now, a hundred years from now, when people look back historically, they'll say, "Wow, the 2020s were crazy," right? And I think it's going to be volatile to both the upside and the downside. And I large and so I think there's going to be incredible opportunities, but I think there's people that are going to get blown up to the upside and the downside as well. The party's over as of this morning. There's going to be considerable turmoil in the markets for the foreseeable future. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Milkshakes Markets Madness. This is a show Brent and I do together every week. If you're unfamiliar with why Milkshakes is in our name, that's Brent's dollar milkshake theory. If you go to the top of our YouTube channel, we have a playlist that says start here. That'll fill you in. Um, a couple weeks ago in a recording that we did, Brent also gave a very brief synopsis or retake on what the milkshake is. So you can also go to that episode to kind of get the shortened version of that. Um, Brent, it's it's been a cool couple, two weeks for us in that we've actually had something to talk about. Uh, one of the themes that was big all last year was your idea of violently sideways where markets were just kind of grinding up and down, but not really breaking out either way. Tech really led the charge at the beginning of this year, and then it went kind of quiet outside of that. Now, last week we had non-farm payroll, which is an employment data set uh, that gave us kind of a sense of, hey, is it the employment sector heating up? And if it is, potentially how that would drive Fed monetary policy. We laughed about kind of the, the joke of the data because the um, numbers that are coming in keep beating expectations, but then they dramatically revise the number the, the next month over. This week, uh, we had CPI, which is the inflation report. Another inside joke of ours is every week, it's the most important CPI ever. Um, this one was kind of in line. And then we had a bunch of other data sets we can talk about that were re related to CPI. So with that kind of intro, um, what did you think about the, the CPI data and how the market reacted and overall where things have been the last two weeks? Well, I think the, the best way to describe all of the inflationary data we got this week, there was two or three different releases, is that there was a little bit of something for everybody in them. You know, if you're somebody who thinks that inflation is kind of under control and on its way down, well, you know, you, you, everything kind of came in in line, maybe a slight beat on a couple of them, uh, but then a couple others were, you know, the slight misses. And so you could say, you know, the Fed has inflation under control. We're not still going up at the same rate. And in fact, it's coming down. And the other side is that if you're saying, you know, hey, hold on here, if inflation is going to be stickier than everybody thinks it's going to be, well, there's something there too, because, you know, for, for nine months, uh, you know, inflation has not been going down. It's been going kind of going sideways now. And so, you know, you could make the argument that, you know, perhaps it's not going to go lower. And, and, and I think what's interesting to me is that I think equities kind of, for the most part, went sideways this week. They were up at one point, they were down. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we've bumped up against these all-time highs and we're just kind of, we've kind of plateaued there for the last couple of weeks, at least in equities. You know, gold made its high last week. It kind of retested it this week and pulled back. Silver made its high this week, uh, but hasn't totally broken out. But bonds, bonds reacted more to the inflationary data than anything else. Bonds have had a fairly decent sell-off over the last week as these inflationary prints have come out. Um, so yields have gone, you know, back higher. So so it's interesting to me see the divergence uh, between, um, you know, the different assets. Again, like precious metals, Bitcoin, equities, they're kind of still at their highs uh, or at least testing them. And whereas, you know, bonds, which are a little bit more sensitive, obviously, to interest rates because it's a direct, it's a direct reflection of interest rates. They, they've sold off. So again, who, who's right and who's wrong? You know, we'll have to see. You know, the, the the conventional wisdom is the the bond market is the smart money, and the you know equity market is the dumb money. And you know whether that holds or not, that's that's you know to be determined. But uh, yeah, and now we've got the Fed next week, so you know we, we'll have to see where it goes. Well, Brent, you've built yourself somewhat of a a macro celebrity talking about the dollar milkshake theory. Um, more recently, in some of the comments we've seen uh, on the YouTube channel that celebrity has now kind of become more about your quality hair. Um, there seems to be a lot of people who are big fans of, of, your, <laughs> of your hairstyle. Um, I didn't, I missed those. I'm gonna have to go back and look at that. We'll have to see here, you know? Yeah, yeah, there, I, I think I think it became more um, profound this past week because you were sitting in your son's gaming chair and it looked like you kind of had like, um, we weren't sure if you had the Jeff Snyder hairdo or if you became a nun 
what was going on there. Oh, but um, back yeah, to the yeah. point here that you know you you gained some notoriety and attention by bringing kind of a grounded viewpoint to the currency conversation and everything is always going to be the end of the dollar tomorrow, the end of the dollar tomorrow. Um, certainly markets have been consistently front running what they expect from the Fed to be easy monetary policy at some point. At some point, something's going to break. At some point, interest rates need to be cut. Uh, one of the things you, you talk about frequently, though, is that the Fed's not going to cut. It's, it, they are a reactionary mechanism, and they're not going to cut or make monetary pol policy easier unless there's something bro uh, broken or breaking and there's, there's chaos in the marketplace. With that in mind, you know, when I look at what's going on, I, we, we've we've also kind of given the, the Fed some credit because they've been able to raise 550 basis points without having this recession or crash. But I, the, the equity markets and this FOMO and the animal spirits aren't giving them any room to kind of normalize real rates so that the banking system doesn't you know, continue to suffocate. Where do we eventually normalize? Is that, is that all in the past? Are we in a brave new world? And although Fed monetary policy matters, is the, is the tail really wagging the dog from here on out? Is our equity market just going to front run policy? Well, you know, the, that's kind of the million dollar question. I mean, I, I would say that I think what's happening with equities is largely, you know, what we've talked about over the last couple of weeks uh, with 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 the dollar milkshake, you know, and, and, and you mentioned this maybe a month or six weeks ago saying, hey, you know, we've been waiting for this correction, but maybe we just don't get it. And maybe the flows into the United States keep equities supported. And, you know, I think that's that, that's very possible. Um, you know, again, I've always said, I've, I've, again, I've, I'm not short everything. A lot of people think that because I believe the dollar goes higher, they automatically assume that that means I think all assets go lower. And, and that's actually not the case. You know, I'm, I'm actually, you know, kind of the more controversial part of, of, of my thesis is that we're going to get a situation where the dollar rises and equities rise together. That's largely happened over the last four or five years anyway. Um, but what I think is happening is, you know, we've, we've, we've got a situation where despite all the problems in the U S it's just better than everywhere else around the world. And so everywhere else around the world sends their capital here, it goes into the dollar and then it goes into equities. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've tried to explain kind of how this could happen on several different occasions. And I think I've done an okay job of it, but you know, I listened to a podcast, I'm going to, I'm going to give somebody else a, a plug here. I listened to a podcast earlier this week. Um, it was with um, uh, Adam Taggart of Thoughtful Money, and he was interviewing Michael Howell of Cross Border Capital. And for anybody who's interested in our show and you know kind kind of what the things I talk about, I, I would strongly encourage you to, to watch this and listen to Michael Howell because he does a very good job of explaining um, things that could support you know equities going higher. In fact, he thinks that we are are in a situation where we are in a bull market. He thinks that we could have a pullback, kind of similar to me, but he thinks equities could very easily go high for the next uh, year, 18 months, 24 months. And he paints a very good scenario of how it could happen. Now, I'm not saying you need to go listen to this because I know for sure that he is 100% right. I'm just saying if you're bearish, it makes sense to listen to him because he paints a, a good picture of why, despite all the disbelief of what's going on now, why it could continue. So I, I would encourage people to check that out. Now, part of that, though, is that, you know, going back to your question on monetary policy, are we just going to throw it away? And it, or is it the tail wagging dog? You know, I, I don't think I would go that far because I do feel like monetary policy is going to be a big part uh, of markets going forward and not just monetary policy in the United States, but also monetary policy around the world again. We can get into a situation where the Fed, I think the Fed wants to cut rates. They've been pretty clear that they they intend to do so. And I, I don't think that they would have pounded the table so hard, or I don't think I don't think they would have made their their pivot so obvious if they didn't want to cut rates. Now I've always thought the idea that they were going to cut seven times without pain in the market was kind of ridiculous. But it doesn't mean they can't cut once or twice. And, you know, uh, I was talking to somebody today and they, they were reminding me, you know, back in 1995, there was a situation where the market was expecting several rate cuts. And I think by the end of the year, they just got one or two. But yet it was a good year in the markets. And it was a good year in the markets basically because markets were front running the eventual Fed policy. So to your point, I think we maybe have a little bit of the, of, of the tail wagging the dog. But I also believe 
that because the debts have gotten so big, and, be, and not just in the U.S., but all around the world, we are going to have some consequences of this. And because that, I think the dollar will rise versus other currencies, that in itself can cause some of these problems that then lead to monetary policy changes. And, you know, I, I think we've seen over the last couple of weeks, we, we've kind of seen the fact that, you know, while the Fed may want to cut, the rest of the world is probably going to have to cut as well, you know. And so if we get into this situation where the Fed doesn't cut seven times, but they cut twice, and everybody thought maybe the ECB cuts once or twice and they end up cutting three times, well, that that changes a lot of things. And so, you know, I think as we get here, you know, into, into Q2 and Q3, we're going to start to see some of that stuff play out. Look, I, I think it's important for people to understand, especially given new to the show and, and just generally some of the comments I see that overall your portfolio rides this wave higher, you know, equity markets in general tend to go up and to the right, but you do have at various times a defensive posture. Um, you're also, however, not much of a day trader, so to speak. You're not in and out, in and out. Um, you have, you know, a, a theme or, you know, a, a, a way that you're approaching this market. But given the analogy you just provided this, you know, 1990s example, and, you know, looking at just overall market conditions, the argument that, you know, uh, Mr. Howell made on the other podcast. And for those who don't know, cap or, um, cross border capital generally focuses on market liquidity. So that's why it's a very relevant conversation because liquidity arguably drives everything. And so his, the way he approaches market forecasting is kind of following those liquidity trends. So keeping those things in mind, this point you made about the 90s, where and again you're not you're not a, you're not picking price and and making huge speculations in day trading but at what point where are you looking at in terms of gauging your defensiveness like how when do you put on yeah. more defense in this environment well that's the really hard thing and you know i i, I wish i had an easy answer for you i i don't know i you know i i, I have defensive positions in the form of t-bills and i have defensive positions in the form of some equity puts uh you know but if, if I didn't change anything right now and we had a 25% down swoop in the, the equity market, we would feel that we would lose money in that scenario, but we wouldn't lose a lot. You know, we would, we certainly wouldn't be down 25 uh, and, and we would probably wouldn't be down very much, but we'd probably be down a little. So the, the point is, is I'm not positioned, you know, to, 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 to make out big. If we do get this swoon, what, 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 what would happen is that, you know, if equities continue to rise higher, we're going to make money, but we're going to trail the overall market. Um, and, and But we're getting to the point where I'm probably going to have to decide whether I want to put more protection on or not. And here's the thing. Sometimes I will buy like a three or four month option. And sometimes I'll just do like a week or something, you know, especially something around like a Fed meeting or a CPI release or, or whatever it is. Um, and so I always say when... When people listen to these things, you know, these interviews and these things, you know, look at the date that we're talking because it's very possible three days from now I'll change my mind. I don't change my mind that often, but it's very possible that I do. And so I think that's the hard thing is when when equities are at their high and the VIX is low, I probably my my historically what I've done is I've I've, I've added to puts a little bit. Right. And then when you get uh, an equity pullback and a VIX spike, then I'll typically sell a few of those, you know, and take a little bit off the table and kind of play, play, play the puts and, and the hedges a little bit tactically. Uh, but, but I don't have a perfect answer for you, and I wish I did. But he here's what I know is most assets are up their all-time highs. VIX is near its all-time low. Um, sentiment is very high uh, in, in risk assets. Sentiment is very low in volatility. That's not if, if, if you're out there with no protection, you know, the time to buy insurance is is when you don't need it. And, you know, Noah, when did Noah build the ark before the rain? You know, so uh, so th th that's kind of how I look at it. I wish I had a perfect signal for it, uh, but I don't. But, uh, you know, probably going to have to make some kind of a decision here in the next week or so. <laughs> so not not to tease you too much, but. Um, Jim Cramer has always kind of been lauded as as a bit of a joker and anti sentiment, right? It's like whatever he says is bullish tends to be, you know, goes the opposite direction and, and vice versa. So I wonder if the signals is when you emotionally get to the point where you start buying zero day to expiration <laughs> options. Is that like the, uh, the 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 moment that we should be going long, or 
or you know where well, you know it's it, it's funny it's funny because you know i fully realize and admit that that you know one day to expiration or zero days to expiration you know the, these options i i think they've affected the market they've kind of changed the structure of the market and i think they have the potential to dramatically blow up one day but I'm also going to sit here and tell you that I use them from time to time because it's it's nice to be able to hedge your portfolio for a 24 hour period, you know, especially around some kind of a big economic release or some kind of a you know a headline event that, that could have an impact. Well, I'd like to um, carry the thread a little bit further as you're talking about you know I, had, I presented you or reminded everyone with the comments you've made you know as the Fed being a reactionary mechanism and that. You know, if these things aren't happening in a vacuum, you're going to most likely have some type of, of monetary response somewhere else or the ECB cut rates first, or even if they don't cut first, they'll probably cut more, et cetera. And one of the things, too, that, that I think oftentimes people misunderstand when you kind of get cornered as the dollar guy is, you know, especially right now when you're having a bit of a euphoria um, and tech is kind of having a, a, a moment. Bitcoin is now and crypto is now surging into what might be a, a new cycle, a new bull market cycle. You, you know, you sometimes get lumped into maybe that like Peter Schiff category where, you know, you think it's all garbage and going to zero. When in reality, your, your, your argument about the dollar is just to give people something grounded, a framework to work from and to understand that, yeah, asset prices can go up versus the dollar, real estate, crypto, gold, all those things. You're a full believer of that. But it's the relative game that you often talk about. And it's very, very unlikely near impossible, which is where I'm going to hand this off to you, that you see hyperinflation, hyperinflation in the U.S. because of the design of the system. And this is something that gets thrown at you frequently when you're making these you know, dollar milkshake arguments. Yeah, so. You know, for we don't we don't want to beat the drum too much and just talk about the dollar all the time. But the reason that we talk about it a lot is because it is so important. Um, again, if you get the direction of the dollar relative to other fiat currencies wrong, it's really hard to get everything else right. It's not impossible, but it's just very hard. And and part of the reason that I you know I've pounded the table as hard as I have on the dollar is really to be a counterbalance to all the ridiculous, in my opinion, and constant calls for the dollar's debt. And, you know, I, I feel like there's not too many people that talk positively about the dollar, but there's dozens and dozens and dozens that, that talk negatively about it. And they're very, uh, they're very well known and they're very popular. And so I try to be like a sounding board on the other side. And, 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 and again, it's not so much that I, I, I'm not, a, some people will say I'm a dollar maxi. Well, I'm actually not a dollar maxi because I don't think you should go out and sell everything you own and just sit in dollars. But a gold maxi thinks you should sell everything you own and just go buy gold. Bitcoin maxi thinks you should sell everything and go buy Bitcoin or whatever it is. You know, my, my point is that, listen, this idea that the dollar is going to fall or it's going to go into hyperflation or it's going to get replaced by a BRICS currency. If you believe that that's a possibility, and as a result, you have a small percent of your portfolio uh, aligned for that, then I think that makes total sense. But if you think that that is a, rather than a small possibility, you think that is a high probability event. And as such, you have a high portion of your portfolio aligned for the dollar losing global reserve currency status or going into hyperinflation or whatever it is, you stand to get hit upside the head with a two by four because it's just, in my opinion, not going to work out like that. And, and I'm, I'm going to try to, in a very simplified manner, explain why. And that is, whenever we've seen currencies that have gone through hyperinflation, it has never been the global reserve currency. And in, 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 and in the last 50 years, whenever we've seen a thing, it's, it's never been the dollar. It's always been some, you know, currency and some, you know, emerging market or some backwater market or however you want to describe that, right? And the reason, the reason that it goes into hyperinflation, these currencies have gone into hyperinflation is because there is no demand outside of that country for that currency. So when that government or that monetary authority kind of gets out of control and they just start printing, 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 printing and creating more money, 
it doesn't leave the domestic boundaries. It stays in the country. And before long, um, you know, currency weakness starts to impact the economy and then they have to print even more. And you get into this spiral where the currency just loses all value. We've seen this in Turkey. We've seen it in Egypt. We've seen it in Ecuador. We've seen it in uh, Lebanon. Uh, we've seen it in Russia. We've seen it all over the place. But we've never seen it in the U.S. And the reason we haven't seen it in the U.S. is there is more demand outside the United States for dollars than there is inside the United States. And until the rest of the world no longer needs to use dollars, you are not going to have hyperinflation in the U.S. dollar. And so then now people will say, well, yeah, so then they're just going to switch to this other currency. Well, they can't switch to the other currency. Well, why can't they switch to the other currency? Because they've taken out $30 trillion or more in U.S. dollar debt, and they don't owe that debt to the United States. They owe it to, the, they owe it to themselves. And so then people will say, well, why don't they just default on it? Then, then they don't have to worry about it. Okay, so here's a question for you. If the rest of the world can just default on $30 trillion and it's no big deal, then why can't the U.S. just default on $30 trillion and it's no big deal? The point is, is it's all the same system. In other words, for most currencies, the domestic boundary of that country is kind of the, the, the boundary of that currency's use. Now, it's not a total 100% rule, but in general, that's, that, 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 that's kind of the case. But in, with the dollar, that's not the case. There is no domestic boundary for the United States dollar because literally everywhere in the world uses it and there's demand for it everywhere in the world. And so, you know, unless the rest of the world wants to default on all that debt, and then when they do that, they're not just going to lose $30 trillion in debt, they're going to lose $30 trillion in assets because one person's debt is another person's asset. And if when you take in, in a debt-based monetary system, when you loan money into existence, and this is really important to understand, when money is loaned into existence, it immediately creates an equal amount of demand for that new supply because it's been made in the, in the form of a loan. So let's say if you go out and you take out a million dollar loan to build a factory, you, that new, that, that, that's a million dollars that has just been created out of thin air. That is new supply. But there is also a new 100, or there's a new $1 million of demand to pay that currency back. And in fact, there's actually more than a million dollars because there's, a, there's interest attached to that loan. So in other words, in a debt-based monetary system, there is never enough supply to meet the demand. There is always more demand than there is supply. Now, the one thing that could potentially change this is if they started actually physically printing money that was not loaned into existence. In other words, it was literally, literally physically printed. Then you could have very high rates of inflation. And under that scenario, then you could get into a hyperinflationary scenario. But even in that scenario, they would have to physically print enough to pay off all of the debts and then keep printing. So... Again, it's it's important to understand the the design of the system. It's 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 and and I know people don't like it when I say the U.S. is different or the U.S. is special or the U.S. you know you can't analyze the United States the same way as you can everybody else. It's not that the U.S. is special, so to speak. It's just they're the house and the rules are different for the house than they are for the guy sitting at the blackjack table. And you know it, it it's it's. It's one thing to not think it's fair. It's fine if you don't think it's fair, but if you're going to accurately analyze it, you need to understand the rules of the game. And in a debt-based monetary system, again, you're just not going to have hyperinflation for a currency that has more external demand than internal demand. And, and, and it's for that reason that I push back so hard against the constant and inevitable, here it comes, the Fed's really going to print it this time, the dollar's going to go away. The bricks are going to rise. All you have to do is buy gold and Bitcoin and you're going to be fine. Buy real assets. And it's not that you shouldn't buy real assets. It's not that you shouldn't buy Bitcoin. It's not that you shouldn't buy gold. It's just that you can't just go buy those things and think everything is 100% taken care of as a result of that. Well, one of the things, too, you have referenced before, even in a situation where, let's say, a central bank, even if it was the Fed, 
was flat out printing money, which they haven't really done yet. It's always about um, quantitative easing where they're absorbing a supply of debt that the treasury issues. But if they were to print money, so to speak, and even if you consider that printing money, it's the idea which you've shared is how much are they printing matters relative to the size of the hole or this huge gap of, That's right. of, of supply to meet a maybe even much larger demand. So keep that in mind too, is that even in a crisis when there's this response, um, unless you're able to very accurately measure the whole, you're probably going to get things wrong. And one would argue the Fed got it really wrong. You know, another thing you mentioned here that's that's worth referencing is the core idea that money is actually debt. There's something I um, watched probably two decades ago. It's it like a cartoon animation story that's called Money is Debt. And I'll put that on our channel so people can watch that. I think it's one of the most brilliant ways of, of giving people that foundational understanding of how the system works. You've also gone through, um, and it's in our Start Here playlist, explaining this, this idea of, of how um, you know the monetary system here in the US is actually being fed through into the Euro dollar markets. Um, but one of the things that you have talked about even, even recently is the fact that, and perhaps you can explain this a little bit further, which you kind of hinted on, is that this this is an issue that they have loaned to each other. So it's not even you know that the Fed is creating this demand, that it's, it's demand that's being created outside of our system by entities and central banks and central planners that, that don't actually have the ability to even print the dollar. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, again, I, I think the, the thing that many people miss, and, and listen, it's understandable why people miss this, because, I mean, I, I, I know people that have worked on Wall Street for 30 years, and they, they don't even know what the euro dollar market is. So, you know, it's not surprising that, you know, somebody who works in manufacturing in the Midwest and tries to keep up with their 401k might not be, you know, the world's expert on the euro dollar market. So if, so if, you, if, if you feel like that's you, don't, don't feel bad. But, but the reality is, is the euro dollar market is extremely important. And the euro dollar market is the market for dollars outside the United States. It's again, it's when I mean, companies, countries, you know, big corporations, big international entities, they use dollars to operate on the global stage and they, they get their funding in dollars and they borrow in dollars. And part of the reason they do that is because it's the global reserve currency, it typically has the lowest rate of interest attached to it. And it's the most widely accepted. So they don't get stuck holding a bunch of rupees like when, um, you know, when, when, when Russia sold a bunch of stuff to India and India paid for them in rupees. Well, now, in, you know, Russia's sitting on billions of dollars of rupees that they can't use. That's not the, that's, there's not a risk of that with the dollar. You know, if you, if you accept dollars or if you transact in dollars, you know that other entities are going to take it. Um, and so that market, is enormous that that market outside the United States, where 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 dollars provide the funding and trade takes place in dollars and borrowing takes place in dollars, that market swamps in size the U.S. domestic market. So it's an enormous market, and and, and th so the idea that they could just stop doing it would literally be shutting down the monetary system. The rest of the world stopping using the dollar would be the equivalent of co what happened during COVID when everybody just stopped and transactions stopped, companies stopped lending, nobody did, nobody traded. I mean, th that's really what we're talking about unless there was a replacement. And here's where people are going to say, yeah, well, they could use gold, they could use Bitcoin, they could use this new BRICS currency. Okay, so theoretically, yes, they could do that if it was ready to go and if everybody agreed. But the example that I will use is, let's use Europe over the last 10 or 15 years. Europe over the last 10 or 15 years has regulated, mandated, however you want to talk about it, a number of green energy, new, new policies geared towards green energy. We're going to transition away from this legacy you know, fossil fuels because there's got to be a better way. You can equate that to the rest of the world saying, you know what, we're going to transition away from the U.S. dollar. There's got to be a better way. And sir, they've had they've talked about it and they've passed laws about it and they've implemented incentives to do it. But two years ago, when Russia invaded Ukraine. And what happened to traditional ener energy prices? Oil went through the roof and national gas went through the roof. And the reason was 
is because despite all these plans, despite all these rules, despite all these proclamations and incentives, this new, this green new energy system is not up and ready to go. And that's the same thing with these new currency systems and these new monetary systems and these new, you know, payment rails. Yeah, they exist. Yes, people are working on them, but they're not ready to transition the entire global monetary system onto their rails. And I believe that before they're ready for those to happen, you know, we're going to have a crisis or we have the potential for a crisis. And if, if, if a crisis hits before all of this stuff is ready to go and fully tested and fully um, implemented and everybody's on board with it, then you're going to see traditional finance or traditional funding markets, which is the euro dollar, go up in price just like you saw natural gas and oil go up in price, you know, a couple of years ago. So this idea that the euro dollar market is not a big deal, it's easily replaced, all that we have to do is have a conference and say, okay, now we're going to use this, it's, it, it is the height of uh, insanity to think that that can just happen like that. Madness. It's absolute madness. 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 <laughs> uh, awesome explanation. I appreciate that. You know, it's... Um, I meant to say this last week, but sometimes we jump on these shows, get going, and then we say our goodbyes and we're, we're off to whatever else we have going on. Um, but when you referenced, you know, the um, down to earth, blue collar, Midwest guy, country boy, trying to make sense of all this, it, it made me think of my father who um, I want to give a shout out to because he just turned 92 last week and I meant to give him a happy birthday, uh -huh. birthday shout out for that. So, um, you know, not many people happy birthday. Make it yeah, not many people make it that, you know, to that age. Um, he's doing great. You know, my mom is just as spry as he is. So uh, I love them both. But one of the things that's really interesting about my father, when we have these conversations, you know, they watch it on the weekend. It's very much one of those things where so many in this, so many people in this world and certainly in the finance space um, stress themselves out to such huge extents over 50 basis points. You know, they're sitting on millions of dollars. And even if you don't have millions of dollars, you're, you're, you're probably somewhere in a comfortable space if your mind is such that you're trying to get the type of edge that we hope to provide. Um, and I look at my father being able to live such as uh, a healthy, happy, long life like he has. And so much of that comes down to the fact that he isn't worried about these little things. And, and sometimes it's a good reminder when we're, you know, deep in the, in the trenches of the financial world that like sometimes, what are we arguing about? So just a, a little down yeah. to earth reminder for my down, down to earth pops and happy birthday to him. Um, we Absolutely. have, we have something else that I want to, I want to add on to what you were just talking about. And it comes from a comment. The comment is, uh, Brent is brilliant on the market rally though. Short-term correction doesn't matter with AI coming to replace the labor for force. This may be the final divide between the haves and the have nots. Hence the panic on the way up. I want to add one more thing to that comment and then get your thoughts. We have um, a migration or well, an invasion of migration issues, so to speak, in the southern border. This is something that's been talked about for a long time. We now have this, this thing happening in, in Haiti. Um, and there's people talking about the uh, similar issues back in the 90s or 80s or 90s um, with Cuba. And so with this comment about AI changes every everything and, and it can potentially create these huge uh, deflationary forces because people are falling out of the labor force. Um, they're being redundant for one reason or another. Now you also have all this uh, potentially cheap labor coming in, uh, filling in a lot of the jobs that older or more privileged Americans don't want to do. Um, do you see that as a potential offset where what we were talking about earlier in the show the something breaks, the Fed responds, markets are already front running that because they think there's going to be this massive accommodation. But maybe the hole, the deflationary hole is much bigger than people expect because number one, AI um, is only just getting started. And we, we do have maybe this lower income labor force that's growing right underneath our nose. Yeah. And so this is what what you're talking about here. It's absolutely possible. Now, I, I don't know for sure whether it's going to happen, but I but I but I understand how the system works and I know based on how the system works. And if, if what you're talking about takes place, there is absolutely the potential for deflationary forces to, to overrun the inflationary forces of the Fed or, or, or whatever it is. And this is why I say 
even if you know that fiat currency loses value over time, and even if you know that the central banks are more involved now than they ever have been, and even if you know the central bank put still exists, and if we get in any kind of downward spiral, they're going to come to the rescue. Even if you know all that, which I agree with, you can't bet 100% on it. Because number one, you just don't know what's going to happen. And number two, markets ultimately are more powerful than central banks. And if we get in, and debt is deflationary. And so this is what I kind of think is funny. Everybody says, oh, we've got debts at their all-time high. We're going to have these big consequences. And as a result, the dollar is going to lose value. I'm like, do you understand what you're saying there? Like, <laughs> the dollar loses value when debt doesn't have consequences. If, it, if debt does have consequences, that means that the dollar's rising and asset prices are falling. So if you think that debt has consequences and that we've borrowed beyond our means, and when I say we, I just mean the whole world. Um, you know, when, 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 when a debt-based monetary system starts to contract, unless you get it under control immediately, it has the potential to, you know, uh, you know, domino from one level to another. And the hole can get so big so quick that the Fed can be shoveling money into it, but the hole's getting bigger than they're throwing in. And so, and, and maybe, I'm not saying that they won't eventually get it under control, but, the, but there's nothing that says they have to get it under control in 24 hours. And there's nothing that says they can even get it under control in two weeks. And a lot can happen in two weeks. I mean, if you remember, so this week, this week is the four-year anniversary of when they basically shut the markets, right? Or, or when everything kind of went cr totally crazy. And it took them a couple of weeks to get it under control, the 20th. Uh, so I think it was like the 10th or the 11th is when things, I think it was the 10th when they did the emergency rate, I think it was March 10th, it was a Sunday, if I have this right, or maybe it was a, they did an emergency rate cut and people thought that was going to solve it and it didn't. And then by the 20th, you know, things, markets were down another 20% or whatever. And so by the 20th, then they came out and they they threw everything at it. But a lot of damage was do, done between that first rate cut and the, the, the package that showed up. And some people got wiped out during that time period. So if, in other words, if you stayed in the market and you were able to, 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 to bridge that gap between the time that the, the shit really hit the fan and they saved things and then were able to ride it back up, well, then you were okay. But, you know, there were people that got wiped out during that time. And the other thing is, you know, you look back to 2008. Um, I, I, and I think, I think even, you know, people as bad as 2020 was, the Fed got it under control relatively quickly. So even though the drawdown was incredible, they got things under control relatively quickly. And so I think people automatically assume that if something like that happens again, the Fed will get it under control even faster. Well, they might. I can't rule that out. So you need to be prepared for that as well. But there's nothing that says they have to be able to get it under control that quickly. You know, I, I would point to 2008. 2008. That was a case where, you know, in the summer of 2008, Ben Bernanke was saying subprime is contained. And it wasn't another nine or 10 months until we got to the bottom of the market, right? And there was multiple bailouts, multiple QE episodes, multiple congressional, uh, you know, votes on on funding, bailout funding. And, and a lot of it didn't work. So, you know, and a lot of people got blown up from the time they first started cutting rates in, 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 in the fall of 2008 until they finally, you know, got everything under control in March of 2009. So the point is, is in this debt based monetary system, when you have deflationary forces, whether it's immigration, whether it's AI, whether it's just the, the, the incremental amount of debt makes it even harder to grow. There's a number of different catalysts that can send us into a debt spiral. Now, again, I'm not saying it's guaranteed to happen. I'm just saying if you're going to totally ignore it, I think that you're uh, you're being naive. You know, the idea of avoiding drawdowns is so important to risk management that I feel like a lot of people have more of a YOLO mindset. 
um, or would even criticize if the S and P's eight to ten percent annually, and someone's producing six to eight percent returns. It's like, well, I can just buy the S and P. It's like, yeah, but when you carry that across a twenty or thirty year portfolio or managed portfolio, those drawdowns can create significant um, impact to you know long term wealth. I think even more important than just that is like you said, I mean, you're, what you're talking about, if you get completely blown up, we're not even talking about big drawdowns, we're talking about complete wipeout, uh, you know, you're starting at yeah. zero. And so a lot of times that's what you're you're ultimately trying to avoid. Um, Brent, you're the money guy, I'm more the business entrepreneur guy. It's similar lessons. I think it might've been a Steve Jobs quote, but there was the, you know, someone in that, that kind of pedigree made the comment that a lot of their success simply just had to do with being able to last long enough. The longer that you can stay in the fight, the greater you increase the odds of, of actually being able to capitalize on, on great opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. And here, here's, I, I've said this many times, so if I'm repeating it on this show, uh, I apologize, but I really believe that the next four or five years are extremely pivotal. I, I think I think 100 years, from now, 100 years from now, when people look back historically, they'll say, wow, the 2020s were crazy right and i think it's going to be volatile to both the upside and the downside and i large and so i think there's going to be incredible opportunities but i think there's people that are going to get blown up to the upside and the downside as well and so i largely view kind of the next four to five years as the most important thing is just to survive in advance you know protect your capital and survive get through it because I think it has the potential to really wipe some people out. And if you if you can avoid the big drawdowns, you'll get through it. But if you if you are all in on something, and for whatever reason, if there's one or two weeks of madness that goes against you, even if you're right long term, you can get wiped out. And so, you know, if I if I look at the the accounts I've managed over the last couple of years, you know, we didn't get hurt in the early part of 2020. Um, so we were ready for that. What side is we didn't make as much coming out of it, right? But then we got into 2022 and, you know, a lot of people were down 20, 30, 40 percent in 2022 and we, we weren't. We were ready for that. And so and then last year we, we trailed in last year. So if you look over the last three or four years, you know, I'd say the returns of, of ours versus the market are pretty similar, but we didn't have the drawdowns. And 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 again, it's 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 if you can play all those swings perfectly, well, then, you know. Amen to you and congratulations. I I'm not smart enough to know all of the all of the peaks and all of the valleys. Um, so what I've had to do is come up with a framework for allows me to stay in the game while things are trending up and to the right, and even if we're trailing a little bit, uh, but not suffer those 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 horrible drawdowns along the way and get knocked out of the game altogether. Awesome. Look, I think that's a great place to end it. Um, as always, fun conversation. Appreciate your wisdom. We appreciate everyone who joins us every week. Again, I've mentioned a few times, if you're new to the show and you've made it this far, there's a lot of organized content on the YouTube channel. Uh, you can go deeper on a lot of these topics. You'll find, you know, in some form or another, it laid out in a way where you can handpick those topics. Um, if nothing else, go to the Start Here playlist and, and start diving into to, to those clips that we've curated for you. Other than that, Brent, um, do you want to close up with any last comments or anything on your mind before we uh, say goodbye to the Milkshakes fam? No, you know, I'm getting excited. We've got March Madness coming up in the next couple of weeks. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to watching some of that. That's always a fun time of year. And, you know, we've got March Madness. We've got Market Madness. And, um, you know, I'm trying to keep the madness out of my personal life. So far, personal life's going really good. So hopefully there's no madness that shows up there. All right. Well, I, I wish the same for you as well. Um, everyone else out there, stay clear of the madness. Um, enjoy your milkshakes and uh, good luck to you in the markets. We'll see everybody real soon. This show is provided for entertainment and informational purposes only. It should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Neither the hosts, guests, nor any funds they may manage intends to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies.